and endlessly innovative. When Dido established the city, the new city, a lot of people's eyes obviously opened wide and said, hey, a new city, a new start. And as these trading routes that Carthage pioneered expanded, it very rapidly became as international a city as any, anywhere then in the world. Over the next 200 years, Carthage evolves into a major Mediterranean power, establishing colonies in Corsica, Ibiza, and North Africa. By around 700, maybe 650 BC, Carthage is a force to be reckoned with. Everybody's heard of it. Nobody messes with it. It's a very important city. Through expansive trade networks, by the 7th century BC, Carthage's new territories were generating a massive treasure chest. And its population reached 300,000, making it one of the biggest cities in the world. To some extent, you could compare it to a Manhattan. This is a huge population living in a relatively small area. So this is an important commercial and cultural hub, not only for North Africa, but also for the entire Western Mediterranean world. Before the Carthaginians' grand engineering feats had been launched in the name of the gods, Carthage's focus was closer to home. Like America 2,500 years later, the wealth of Carthage drew legions of people looking to make their fortune. Soon the city's architects and engineers had to find a way to house them all, a challenge that would lead to the most remarkable urban building boom in antiquity. There was something very important to the Carthaginian spirit, to its psyche, about staying within the walls of Carthage. So the pressure to design buildings that would accommodate people who wanted to live within the city was very strong. The Carthaginians would be the first on a massive level to turn the city's sky into private property by building apartments. These were as high as six stories, very densely populated. Why? Because people wanted to come to Carthage. It was a successful, happening place. If you wanted to get on in life, you wanted to come to Carthage. To build a city for the ages, first they would need materials with which to build it. The answer was located at El Hawaria on Tunis Bay. There in these remote quarries was a seemingly endless supply of limestone that was both easy to work with and quick to put up. Limestone is the perfect choice for building and there were limestone depositions geologically in that area, in that basin, very close at hand. Archaeologists speculate that like the Egyptians before them, the Carthaginians cut each block of stone using the simplest of means, water and wood. After they've chiseled a dotted line channel along the face of a rock, they take a wooden wedge, stick it in there, if it's deep enough, and then wet the wood. And what will happen naturally is the wood will expand with the water, and then it'll naturally crack the stone. The increased pressure from the expanding wood caused the stone to crack in almost perfect lines. From there, workers separated each block using crowbars and other tools. Once the massive blocks of stone were quarried and transported to the city, the Carthaginians used pier and panel style construction to quickly transform Carthage into a dynamic capital. It's very clear that by using stone in the first place, they weren't ready to pick up and go elsewhere. They were looking down the long term. For each metropolis to survive, it needs a constant source of running water. Carthage was no different, so the ancient city engineers turned to cisterns like this. Each cistern was made of a double layer of eggshell, ash, and clay, made the cistern absolutely watertight. Every home enjoyed access to a cistern through a series of pipes and channels. Carthaginians had fully equipped bathrooms with tubs and sinks and even showers years before ancient Rome. When we have clear evidence way before the foundation of Carthage of domestic plumbing. But it is Carthage by 600 BC or thereabouts, and certainly Carthaginian town of Kirkwain by 450 BC, 
that we have the first evidence of a unified system of water usage and critically sewage. Any fool can put in a bathroom, but the question is what you do with the waste water. And at Kirkawain you see very clearly a unified single system that has piped water to the rooms that need it, the kitchen and the bathroom, but then piping the waste water out to a common sewage system. This was evolutionary, yes, but it is also typically Carthaginian because it's also revolutionary. By the sixth century BC, Carthage was growing into a true city-state, brimming with magnificent temples, glittering palaces, and high-rise houses. But as Carthage's flame burned brighter, the flame of their Phoenician cousins was burning out. The great Phoenician city of Tyre fell to the Babylonians in 574 BC. Carthage was now on its own. Before long, the Carthaginians would sail beyond the dusty shores of North Africa, continuing to expand their empire by conquering the seas. 520 BC, 3,000 oars propel 60 ships through the Pillars of Hercules, known today as the Straits of Gibraltar. Hanno the Navigator, the great admiral of Carthage, is sailing to the edges of the known world he is preparing to launch a power play that could lead to total domination of the Mediterranean. So every great explorer, Christopher Columbus, Vasco da Gama, who's sailed off into the unknown, seems to me a very strong parallel for the original and best of them, Hanno the Navigator. Hanno set sail to extend the boundaries of the Carthaginian network of colonies and exchange, not mere trading activities, but planting whole cities of new settlers to maintain control of land and access to its resources. Carthage's technical prowess on the seas has brought it power and wealth. By the sixth century BC, the islands of Corsica, Sardinia, and the Balearic Islands are now under its control. The hub of its power flows from a marvel of engineering, the harbor of Carthage. This is the absolute pinnacle of Carthaginian engineering. Although records are shaky, archaeologists believe it may have been constructed as early as the days of Hanno. But at the height of her power, in the second century BC, the harbor of Carthage was transformed technologically superior to any maritime facility in the world and the very lifeblood of Carthage. It was part of Carthage. It was the heart of Carthage. It was the lungs of Carthage. It was everything to Carthage, both naval and commercial. The harbor had a common entrance from the sea that was 70 feet wide, which could be closed with iron chains. Inside its gates, were two separate marinas, the first for the traders and merchant vessels. The mercantile harbor, the commercial harbor, was organized with conventional wharves to make uh, as easy as possible the loading and unloading of goods. So in Carthage, readily one can imagine in say 400 BC, you would see all the goods there were in the then known world being bought, being brought, being sold, in Carthage. The second, a circular harbor, was designed for military use. A series of 30 docks were arranged symmetrically. Another 140 additional berths radiated out on the perimeter of the circular port, allowing the entire harbor to hold 220 boats. Today, a lone dry dock has been excavated, a reminder of the strength the harbor once commanded. This is all that's left of the Cothon, or military harbor of ancient Carthage. A Cothon was an interior port carved out of the land as opposed to an exterior port attached to the seaside. Now with all these beautiful villas around here, it's kind of hard to imagine that this harbor was the launch point for the wealth and power of ancient Carthage. Now the nerve center for this maritime hub was that circular island out there where there were 40 or 50 slots for boat dry dock. 
And on top of that island was a big tower where trumpeters would blare signals and heralds would deliver orders and admirals would oversee operations like observing what ships were coming in from sea, be they friend or foe, while at the same time those ships couldn't very well observe what was going on in this port. Nobody has anything approaching this potency, this power, let alone this navigational and seafaring skill. So when the barriers are taken off the channel and shoof, within, you know, they're scrambled uh, as they did in World War II with airplanes, these ships are coming out fast down this channel and shoof, out into the Mediterranean. People see them coming, Carthage, is here. For two centuries, Carthage dominated the Mediterranean. But a rival across the sea to the north was steadily evolving into a military machine of unparalleled potency. Rome. These two superpowers would soon find themselves in conflict over the jewel of the Mediterranean, Sicily. Carthage was built to trade, and Sicily was critical to that trading. Why? Because it's right bang slap in the middle of the most important shipping lane in the world. Whoever controls Sicily controls these vital trade routes. The Romans saw the enormous riches that Carthage could command, and it started to just elbow into them. And the Carthaginians nudge back and say, hang on, we were there first. Please, as it were, get your tanks off my lawn. Both Rome and Carthage now had settlements on Sicily. This tension would trigger a series of wars that would rock the ancient world. The Romans saw Carthage as a spear pointed at the very heart of Rome and at their own burgeoning trade empire. So, of course, they felt they had to eliminate it. They would come to be known as the Punic Wars, named after the Roman word for the Phoenicians. The outcome would change the course of world history, and Carthage would be led by one of the greatest military geniuses of all time. At the beginning of the third century BC, the Republic of Rome is called down into southern Italy by a Greek town to help that town against pirates. Now it's not long after that, the two Sicilian cities get at it. One of them, Messina, originally asked Carthage for help, but then they go, nah, let's ask Rome because they're closer, probably a better deal. Syracuse fights Messina and Rome one battle, quits, gives up, turns himself over to Rome, and Rome, in the span of decades, has all of southern Italy and eastern Sicily. This really POs Carthage, and thus begins the First Punic War. And the outcome of this war will not only decide who owns Sicily, but who's gonna be ruler of the entire southern Mediterranean Sea. 264 BC, Rome and Carthage begin the First Punic War. 17 years later, the two sides are still deadlocked in a bloody slugfest. The stalemate appears to be broken only when a fierce and charismatic military commander named Hamilcar Barca takes control of the Carthaginian forces. Hamilcar was the first great general of the Carthaginian Empire. He's the man with charisma. He's the man who knows how to get the job done, how to save their uh, coals from the fire. Between 247 and 242 BC, this fiery military tactician, Hamilcar Barca, sweeps into Sicily. He's dynamic, he's powerful, and he's absolutely ruthless. But what gives Hamilcar his real confidence is that at his back, he has a new sleek form of warship called the Quincurim. Quin meaning five five banks of rowers. The Quinquereme isn't really developed by the Carthaginians, it's developed by the Greeks. But what the Carthaginians do is make this sea-going battering ram huge. In that period of the Punic Wars, wow, they were the feat of shipbuilding and engineering. Quinquereme apparently had five banks of oars. Now there's been some debate exactly how that worked, but it is believed that there were three levels uh, with five guys, two on the top two levels, 
each with an oar, and then one guy at the bottom. But whatever the case, it was a bigger, larger version of the trireme. However, even though it's a bigger version, the tactics involved in naval warfare are exactly the same. The main purpose of these ships is to ram the enemy ship. That's what they were engineered for. Outfitted with a bronze-covered ram, they were designed for speed and maneuverability. These were very, very, very quick. Trying to catch a Carthaginian warship was trying to, like, trying to hit Muhammad Ali in his prime as a boxer. A standard quinquireme was roughly 120 feet long, 9 to 16 feet wide, and could hold up to 420 sailors. Fully manned and loaded, a quinquireme weighed more than 100 tons. On open water, these mega ships were killing machines. This thing is just coming straight at you at a speed you've never dreamt of as possible. And bang! The whole of your boat shakes, your ship shakes and you start to sink. Compare that with the trireme, where often the model was probably much more to engage with the enemy ship and have land fight at sea. The Carthaginians didn't mess about like that. They wanted to get in, they hit you once, and you drown, and they're gone to hit the next one. Deadly. Now, the genius of the Carthaginians was in figuring out how to mass produce these ships. They took sort of prefabricated parts and put them all together on an assembly line. So to an enemy, no sooner would a quincurine be sunk than another one would appear on the horizon. And this was a distinct disadvantage for the Roman Navy until they came upon a wrecked quincurine. And they sort of reverse engineered it. They deconstructed it, figured out how it was put together, put it back together and made it their own. They captured a grounded Carthaginian quinquireme and made dozens of copies of these. In fact, the copies weren't as well made and were made out of green wood. And after one season, they fell to pieces. But never mind, that's all the time the Romans needed to turn the tide. The Roman and Carthaginian fleets would now square off with the ancient world's equivalent of weapons of mass destruction to see who truly owned the seas. March 10th, 241 BC, the fleets met at the Agates Islands off the western coast of Sicily for one of the greatest sea battles of all time. In the hostilities of the First Punic War, the Battle of the Agates Islands fought off the coast of Sicily it was a, a turning point. In the battle between two brilliantly engineered fleets, Carthage had the advantage in numbers. But their sleep-killing machines were bloated with grain and supplies for Hamilcar's army, camped out on nearby Sicily. Many ships were sunk or lost or captured. People weren't expecting that. Now the Carthaginians try to make a break for it, but they are unable to do so because of this extra weight. That gives the Romans the victory. It was a strategic disaster. In the end, the Romans took nearly 30,000 Carthaginian prisoners. With no way of resupplying himself and his troops, Hamilcar was forced to surrender and retreat back to Carthage. It was clear the pendulum of power in the Mediterranean was now swinging ominously toward Rome. In victory, Rome gained not only Sicily, but also Carthage's holdings on Corsica, Sardinia, and the islands between Sicily and Africa. Hoping to cripple Carthage, Rome forced it to pay a large tribute. But Carthage was not ready to give up yet. It turned westward to Spain to generate new wealth. And the Carthaginians send Hamilcar Barca to Spain. So his goal in 237 is to conquer as much of Spain as possible. It took nine hard-fought years for Hamilcar to conquer the native tribes there. When he finally did, all of the land south of the Ebro River becomes part of the Carthaginian Empire. But Hamilcar paid for that conquest with his life. In 228 BC, he was killed in battle with a rebelling native tribe. Hamilcar's death in Spain was a great blow to Carthage, but it was by no means the end of Carthage. In fact, it opened the way for a whole new initiative. 
Legend has it that Hamilcar's nine-year-old son begged to watch his father lead Carthage into battle with Spain. And the father agreed on one condition, that the son would promise eternal hatred of Rome and commitment to that republic's defeat. And it was thus the son, named Hannibal, became the instrument of his father's revenge. And this was the first step on a path that would transform Hannibal into the most devastating foe that the Republic of Rome would ever face. 211 BC, a specter is haunting the Republic of Rome. Outside her walls, with an army poised to strike, is the man Romans fear and loathe above all, Hannibal, the great general of Carthage. Brilliant, brutal, sophisticated, he is Rome's worst nightmare. As if by magic, Hannibal has penetrated Rome's defenses. But the magic is actually Hannibal's strategic genius and the use he makes of one of the world's greatest engineering corps. There's no doubt in my mind that Hannibal wasn't one of the greatest generals in history. I think, demonstrably, he is the greatest general in history. Hannibal's genius is born of a near religious zeal to destroy Rome, handed down to him by his father. In 221 BC, he was given the tools to do it. At the age of 26, he took command of the Carthaginian army. Hannibal was certainly Hamilcar's son. Uh, he was a crafty politician, a brilliant strategist and military man, but his real genius was in knowing when to use all of the great engineering developments that Carthage had at its disposal. As a commander of ironclad courage, he would launch one of the most stunning campaigns of aggression the world had ever seen. Rome had gained control of the Mediterranean, meaning Hannibal could not reach his enemy by sea. Driven to fulfill the vow he had made to his father to destroy Rome, Hannibal set out to do the impossible. He'd march over land, across the Alps, to the heart of the Roman Empire. Now Hannibal knows he's greatly outnumbered. He knows he has a relatively small army in comparison to the Romans, but he does come up with a strategy which he believes will bring him victory. And what he has to do is take his army to Italy itself and attack the Romans on their home field. Hannibal set off in 218 BC with an army of 90,000 men, 12,000 horses, and 37 elephants acquired from African neighbors to the south. Elephants have been used in battle for centuries before this. They could be the turning point in a battle because the cavalry of the enemy could not withstand elephants. Therefore, Hannibal believes it's worth it to try to get these elephants to Italy. By October, they traveled more than 600 miles and came face to face with their first major obstacle, the raging Rhone River in France. Even at its narrowest, uh, shallowest time of the year, the Rhone River is still going to be somewhere between 100 to 150 to 200 meters wide. It's gonna be daunting to all of Hannibal's field engineers. On the other side, a large number of Gauls were waiting to do battle. But the wall of water was a potentially deadly obstacle that had to be vanquished first. Hannibal's builders would have to conquer Mother Nature. Not only are the engineering feats daunting, but you also have crowds of insubordinate and hostile tribes waiting on the other side of the river. The solution would be one of Carthage's most spectacular feats of engineering. A series of giant rafts, large enough to shuttle animals and supplies across the river in record time. These rafts were about 200 feet long and 50 feet wide. Now that means that you can't just use one single tree trunk. You have to also put multiple trees together and then lash those together too. This requires more than a Boy Scout knowledge of knots. With speed and efficiency, Hannibal's soldiers harvested massive conifers from the surrounding forests and connected the trees together with rope. One thing his engineers had to account for 
was the psyche of the elephants. So once the logs were bound together, the barges were piled high with a layer of sticks and a layer of earth so that the elephants would think they were on solid ground. When all was ready, Hannibal gave the signal to release the barges. The Gauls, startled by his boldness, were mystified when they saw the Carthaginian general leading his troops, cavalry, and elephants en masse across the turbulent Rhone. When he arrived at the river's opposite bank, the Gauls broke in panic and fled without striking a blow. The entire operation took a little more than nine days. I think the crossing of the Rhone in such a short space of time using rudimentary equipment is one of the great achievements of military history. And people slightly forget the small engineering miracles that made all this possible. Hannibal and his army continued on and made their way to the foot of the Alps. With winter looming, the troops were starving and exhausted. As they ascended, they confronted another seemingly impossible obstacle, giant boulders. Hannibal's engineers devise a plan that would allow the troops not just to go over, but through. The stratagem of crossing the Alps certainly shocked the people of Italy. No one expected an army with elephants to make it across. And although the Alps may have seemed in places impassable, this idea of breaking up the mountains themselves to create a pathway to get your pachyderms across uh, was a brilliant idea. Now, how did Hannibal get his men not to mention all those elephants, up, over, around, or through these giant boulders. Well, according to the Roman historian Livy, he came up with an ingenious plan along with his engineers that would literally move mountains. They cut big crevices through these boulders, and then they got wood from the surrounding forest. They'd wrap these boulders in the wood, and when the wind was right, they'd torch the wood. The rocks would heat up, and just when they were hot enough, they'd pour boiling vinegar into the crevices, which would shatter or melt the rocks such that his men could break them apart with iron implements. Now, what was Hannibal doing up in the Alps with all this vinegar? Well, if this is true, and we like to think it was, otherwise, how did he get across the Alps? It speaks volumes to the genius of this brilliant general. I'll tell you one thing. After navigating the snow of the Alps, the sight of the plains of northern Italy must have been very, very welcome. On August 2nd, 216 BC, near Cannae in southern Italy, Hannibal faced off against Roman forces under the command of Terentius Varro in a decisive conflict that would seal the fate of these two empires. As dawn breaks, Hannibal draws up a force of 50,000 men newly strengthened with the help of hired mercenaries against Varro's nearly 90,000 Romans. Varro decided to try and crush his opponent, sending a massive force to attack Hannibal's center. This would prove to be a fatal mistake. Anticipating Varro's strategy, Hannibal orders his cavalry to circumvent the Roman ranks from the rear. Hannibal had certainly done his homework in studying the psychology of his opponents and he was able to trick them into his center and then his forces could engulf them. Completely surrounded, the Romans were slaughtered where they stood. Only 3,500 Romans managed to escape. 10,000 were taken prisoner and 70,000 were left dead on the battlefield. At the Battle of Cannae, the single greatest defeat ever inflicted on a Roman army throughout its entire history. And of course, we have to go to World War I to find a scale of slaughter as big. Cannae was a masterpiece of military strategy, but Hannibal was unable to capitalize on his string of victories. He fought on for another 13 years, mounting siege after siege on Rome and its surrounding cities. But ultimate victory remained elusive. He could defeat them in the field, but he lacked the proper weapons to take on the Roman capital. In 204 BC, Rome went on the offensive and launched an attack on Carthage. 
Hannibal finally returned home to muster its defense. In 204 BC, Scipio Africanus, who had already beaten the Carthaginians in Spain, convinced Rome to let him go around Hannibal altogether and attack Carthage directly. Hannibal was recalled to his city to defend it. Now these two heavyweights met and spoke. We have no idea what they said to one another. It's lost to history. In 202 BC, they met again at the Battle of Zama. And Hannibal was defeated. And he was forced to surrender to an enemy that he'd spent his entire life trying to destroy. He would not fulfill his father's wishes. He was exiled from Carthage, and years later, in your present-day Turkey, he committed suicide. Carthage's defeat at the end of the Second Punic War forces the empire to submit yet again to Roman terms. They are forced to surrender in 202 BC. The Romans again impose very harsh peace terms on the Carthaginians, meaning, first of all, they must again pay an indemnity, a tax to the Romans. Also, the Carthaginians lose their overseas territories, meaning their territory is now confined to areas just around Carthage itself. One last very important part of this treaty was that Carthage could not fight a war, any war, even a defensive war, without Rome's okay. With Carthage stripped of its military might, the field was now open for the Roman army to begin its unstoppable conquest of the ancient world. And their first major target would be the wounded city of Carthage. All that stood in the way was the ancient world's strongest fortifications. 150 BC. Marcus Porcius Cato, a Roman orator and the great-grandfather of Julius Caesar's famous enemy, walks the halls of the Roman Senate, but he is oblivious to his surroundings. For him, there is only one thing on his mind, Carthage. Cato was only too well aware of the strategic position of Carthage. He could see that as long as Carthage was an independent stronghold, it was too close to Sicily and Italy to be allowed to harass shipping or maintain a military presence. He wanted it completely wiped out. Now in Carthage, Carthage's one-time ally and neighbor, Numidia, starts to encroach on southern Carthaginian territory. Carthage feels obliged, and rightfully so, to defend itself, but there's a caveat. Since the Second Punic War, Carthage has promised Rome never to take up arms against anyone whatsoever without the consent of Rome. Rome sends a commission down to arbitrate this beef between Numidia and Carthage, and one of the deputies on that commission is Cato. And when Cato sees the prosperity with which Carthage is bounded back since the Second Punic War, he goes right back to Rome. He rails against the Senate that this prosperity means one thing and one thing only. Carthage is going to be at our doorstep with arms in no time. No matter what speech he makes, roads, politics, taxes, he always ends with ceterum sensio Carthaginum esse delenda, which means, furthermore, I say Carthage should be destroyed. Now Carthage, feeling it's going to be annihilated, no help from Rome, takes up arms. Rome sends an army down to Carthage. Rome tells Carthage, you have to abandon and evacuate your city. Carthage refuses. Thus starts the Third Punic War. But now Rome has got a problem, because the strongest fortifications in all of antiquity at that time are the walls of Carthage. Today, time has reduced the fortress to its foundations. But in 149 BC, these protective walls were the city's last hope. It was a three-part wall system uh, with massive stone uh, circuit wall. It covered a huge extent and was thought to be unbeatable. A wonder of the world, those Carthaginian walls. And the Carthaginians trusted them. The wall had a circumference of 23 miles and a series of three protective layers. First, a ditch backed by a low wall packed with excavated soil, which would have been manned by a front line of soldiers who could withdraw quickly in the face of a major assault. The second wall was constructed of stone and dominated the outer defenses. Behind this second wall stood an even more impenetrable third wall, 45 feet in height and at least 30 feet wide. 
15 towers were spaced at 200 yard intervals where watchmen stood guard. Inside this wall lived part of the Carthaginian army, including 20,000 men, uh, 300 elephants, to prepare for any type of attack that took place. The wall system surrounding Carthage made it the best fortified city in all of the Mediterranean, if not the world. And against the Romans, it would face its ultimate test, led by the fabled Carthaginian general, Hasdrubal. The Carthaginian commander who would lead the Carthaginians during the Third Punic War was a Hasdrubal. He is the one responsible for retaliating against the Numidians, and he is the guy who's going to be leading the main resistance. As the Roman legions descended on the city, the Carthaginians hurriedly scrambled to build a new defensive force. The women gave their hair up. They cut their hair so that they could make rope to fire the catapults. They emptied the prisons. The old men volunteered. People who hadn't been blacksmiths for 20 years said, I'll try again, and they rearmed themselves in an explosion of intent and determination that we really have to go to the siege by the Germans of Stalingrad to see again. In two months of frenzied work, they produced 6,000 shields, 18,000 swords, 30,000 spears, 120 ships, and 60,000 catapult missiles. Despite the arsenal Carthage had assembled, Rome had sent an overwhelming force. The city was alone, facing its own destruction. There was no area left alone without Rome or Roman allies with none of the colonies in a position to stand up to Rome. Carthage was left on her own. The city hunkered down behind its immense fortifications, hoping against all odds that their walls would repel the impending Roman invasion. Carthage held off the Roman attack for three years, and even in the last days after the Romans broke through the walls, it took seven days before they could get to the top of the citadel um, of moving through town like a juggernaut. The Roman siege squeezed the life out of the city from the outside. And eventually, although the immense land wall was never breached, the Romans managed to scale those at sea. Inside the city, the fighting continued street by street. Few Carthaginian snipers were left, but they were so fierce that the Roman commander Scipio Aemilianus ordered the city to be set on fire and leveled. Thousands of Carthaginians were burned alive in the blaze. It was a firestorm. It must have been hellish for the residents, people fleeing. During its siege and capture, Carthage had been decimated. The city's population fell from five architects and engineers, had to find a way to house them all, a challenge that would lead to the most remarkable urban building boom in antiquity. There was something very important to the Carthaginian spirit, to its psyche, about staying within the walls of Carthage. So the pressure to design buildings that would accommodate people who wanted to live within the city was very strong. The Carthaginians would be the first on a massive level to turn the city's sky into private property by building apartments. These were as high as six stories, very densely populated. Why? Because people wanted to come to Carthage, it was a successful happening place. Flying channel along the face of a rock, they take a wooden wedge, stick it in there, if it's deep enough, and then wet the wood. And what will happen naturally is the wood will expand with the water, and then it'll naturally crack the stone. The increased pressure from the expanding wood caused the stone to crack in almost perfect lines. From there, workers separated each block using crowbars and other tools. Once the massive blocks of stone were quarried and transported to the city, the Carthaginians used pier and panel style construction to quickly transform Carthage into a dynamic capital. It's very clear that by using stone in the first place, they weren't ready to pick up and go elsewhere. 
they were looking down the long term. Through expansive trade networks, by the 7th century BC, Carthage's new territories were generating a massive treasure chest, and its population reached 300,000, making it one of the biggest cities in the world. To some extent, you could compare it to a Manhattan. This is a huge population living in a relatively small area. So this is an important commercial and cultural hub, not only for North Africa, but also for the entire Western Mediterranean world. Before the Carthaginians' grand engineering feats had been launched in the name of the gods, Carthage's focus was closer to home. Like America 2,500 years later, the wealth of Carthage drew legions of people looking to make their fortune. Soon the cities are and endlessly innovative. When Dido established the city, the new city, a lot of people's eyes obviously opened wide and said, hey, a new city, a new start. And as these trading routes that Carthage pioneered expanded, it very rapidly became as international a city as any anywhere then in the world. Over the next 200 years, Carthage evolves into a major Mediterranean power, establishing colonies in Corsica, Ibiza, and North Africa. By around 700s, maybe 650 BC, Carthage is a force to be reckoned with. Everybody's heard of it. Nobody messes with it. It's a very important city. If you wanted to get on in life, you wanted to come to Carthage. To build a city for the ages, first they would need materials with which to build it. The answer was located at El Hawaria on Tunis Bay. There in these remote quarries was a seemingly endless supply of limestone that was both easy to work with and quick to put up. Limestone is the perfect choice for building and there were limestone depositions geologically in that area, in that basin, very close at hand. Archaeologists speculate that like the Egyptians before them, the Carthaginians cut each block of stone using the simplest of means, water and wood. After they've chiseled a dotted 